we'll have an introduction to deep learning and in particular the plan. Uh, we'll, have a, we'll have an introduction to deep learning, so what are the uh, basic building blocks that are used uh, to build the deep models. Uh, it will be quite brief and we'll focus uh, mainly on intuitions. Uh, also, uh, different way, ways people apply it uh, in the field. Uh, and then we'll see how this is used in the context of uh, generative modeling. So we'll review some generative modeling basics, and then we'll uh, go over the main families of generative models, of deep generative models that exist. So the ones that are based on uh, maximum likelihood, and uh, the ones that are based on adversarial training. So that's the plan for, for this presentation. So, let's have a quick introduction to, to deep learning. Um, well, maybe, probably most of you have heard about convolutional neural networks. That's one type of uh, architecture uh, that is very successful. Typically, it's best suited to situations where uh, we have stationary input signals. So let's say uh, your input arrives all at the same time. So think about uh, images or maybe a video, but you have the entire video from the start. Uh, then you would probably use most of the time a convolutional neural network. So there have been many successful applications, uh, such as object detection, so when you have to find an object in an image, segmented segmentation, here's, a, here's an example where you have to segment out each individual object uh, in an image. Could be image retrieval, where you're given an image and have to find in the database uh, similar ones, pose estimation, etc. There's many of them. Uh, another type of neural network, of deep model, that we won't discuss today is uh, the recurrent neural network uh, and this one is better suited to uh, inputs that are sequential and of variable length and potentially do not arrive all at once. So think for instance about machine translation. Maybe you'd want to translate what I'm saying now in another, in another language, uh, but you don't want to wait for the end of the speech before you start translating. You want to do it real time. So you have uh, a sequence of input. You can say that each word is a token. Uh, and you have to start translating before the end. So, in this kind of setup, you would probably use a recurrent neural network. But, okay, I won't present them today. The main idea is that... Uh, the thing to keep in... Uh, sorry. Oh. Yeah. Uh, is that you have uh, a sequence of inputs, and that you can... Uh, you don't... Okay, look at the little hand. The inputs arrive one after the other, uh, and your model can handle that and also output a sequence uh, with tokens at different time steps. Okay, so uh, let's present deep learning. In general, machine learning, in machine learning, what matters the most, I guess you could say, is the features. If you have the right features, then any task is easy. For instance, if you want to classify cats from dogs, uh, and you're very well able to detect uh, the shape of ears, then this classification task will become easy. So traditionally, uh, let's say before deep learning, the typical way people would do this is uh, engineer low-level features in a smart manner, try to compress information about the image to create very good features, and once they had these very good features, they would apply a classification task. So in this row, you see you start from an image, then you design some uh, low-level feature extraction. So for instance, let's say you want to detect edges. You could compute, the naive way of doing this could be to compute gradients between neighboring pixels. And this should detect the edges. So you would design low-level detectors like this. That will give you a very high uh, dimensional representation of your image. And then you would need to compress this representation. So for instance, you could map uh, these low-level features that you computed to uh, vector space. And then you probably want to, uh, so now that you've aggregate, aggregated the information, you probably, probably want to summarize it, to make it uh, lower dimensional, and you could use something like pooling. So take a, a subset of the values and take the maximum, for instance. This way you aggregate and summarize the data. Uh, and once you have these compressed features, you can apply a classifier. So it could be a linear classifier, for instance. And, uh, and that will give you your answer. So that's... Uh, that's the way people did it a few years ago, uh, for instance, with uh, uh, support vector machines and kernel methods. And the key thing here is that 
the process of uh, creating the features is separate from classification. Okay, so there's a lot of things you could, uh, you could do to create good features, but it's always going to be done first, and then the classification happens. And that's a big difference with uh, the way deep learning is done. Maybe the main one, or you could argue that's uh, that's what makes deep learning work. In deep learning, uh, the distinction between building the features and using them to classify is blurred. So how it works is you start with uh, you start from the image. You don't try to summarize it with hand level, low level features. So you just take the image pixels if you're working with images. Then you will stack uh, some linear, some simple linear transformations, uh, starting from this row image, with non-linearities in between the linear transformation, because if you compose linear transformations, you obtain a linear transformation again. So you need non-linearities in between. And uh, like this, you will learn progressively more abstract representation. So to see this, let's say we take uh, an intermediate linear transformation in this stack, let's say the middle one, uh, where the hand is. This is just a stack of linear operations. So each of these uh, features will separate the space into. But the results of this uh, linear operation will be fed as a feature to the next layer. So, and this will progressively build a non-linear classification. So you can think of it, this as both progressively building features and separating the space in a non-linear manner. So that's my, the, the key message here. Uh, building the features and classifying is done together in an end-to-end -end manner to minimize a task-specific loss. So the features are built using uh, the task and the loss. And that's the key distinction with uh, previous methods. All right. Now these models are... Uh, quite flexible and have a lot of parameters. Uh, and so you need a lot of data to, to, train, to train a model with so many parameters that doesn't overfit. And also we said we're using the, the loss, so if, if you're uh, to train a feature, we're using the loss. So if you're doing classification, for instance, you need labels to train your features. You can't do it in an unsupervised manner in this framework. Okay. Uh, so let's, let's look at... Uh, well, machine Learning 101, now that we've seen pictures. So in Machine Learning, you're given a, a training, training data. So it could be, so it's going to be the, the X here. Uh, and you also have a task. Maybe you need to predict the class of the image that you're given, so cats and dogs. Uh, and so you want to train a prediction function that maps your input to the answer that you'd like to get, OK? Uh, so let's look at the blue term only for now. So you're given an X, you make a prediction, and you compare it to the target uh, that you wanted to have with the loss function L. Okay, that's called the uh, minimum, and you try to minimize this. It's called the empirical risk. Um, so your targets could be binary, uh, it could be multi-class classification, the targets could be continuous if you're doing regression, or uh, even multivariate regression, so more than one dimension. And finally, L evaluates yeah, how good your predictions are. So there is more to, optimize, uh, to machine learning than just optimization. Of course, it's good to have a good performance on the training data, but you also want your model to perform well on data that you hadn't seen before. And uh, the main intuition here is that you would like, for, for a model to perform well on unseen data, it would have to be a simple model. Uh, the idea is that, well, if I give you a few points, and I ask you to separate them with a very flexible function, I won't be surprised if you can actually make it. Whereas if I give you a very complex problem, and you can have good performance where with a very simple model, uh, then it probably means that your model has understood something. So the key intuition here is uh, we'd like to favor simple models. It's called Occam's razor. Uh, the model should perform surprisingly well compared to how much flexibility it has. And then you'll think that it has understood something, and so we'll generalize to unseen data. So in practice, to ensure that you have simple models, you need the red term, the regularization term, that penalizes models that have too much flexibility. Uh, so you optimize this term, and it will bias your training towards simple explanations of the data. OK. So a quick example with linear regression. So in linear regression, you have to assume that you have a linear dependency between your targets and your inputs. 
and you're trying to learn the weights W here. It's just a linear operation. Most of the time you take uh, a loss that is complex, and you'll take a regularization term that is also convex, and it will be the square norm of your weight vector. You optimize all this by gradient descent, so the idea is you compute the gradient of, uh, of this problem, it points toward the direction of steepest descent, you follow this direction, and eventually you arrive to a region where the gradient is zero, means you've reached a local minima, but because this problem is convex, uh, you also know that it's a local uh, global optima, and so you're done. Uh, so in terms of optimization, this, this framework is very good. However, uh, if you do it like this, as we said before, the features and the classification are decoupled. So if you're going to solve your problem like this, it's important that X contains, uh, presents the data in the right manner. Let's say, for instance, you're trying to model the friction of a driving car. Well, we know from our physics classes that friction, uh, well, in the formula there's a term that is proportional to the square of the speed. So if in your x you do put the square of the speed, you'll probably be able to find the right model. But if you don't, there's no way this linear regression is going to work. So that shows that you need to have the right representation of x. Of course, you could use a, a basis expansion, so you could provide many uh, powers of x and hope that uh, the right one is in there. Uh, but maybe it's something else that you need, okay? So the idea here is uh, linear regression is good in terms of optimization, but it decouples the, the, the features from the optimization. Now, the deep learning setting is very different. As we said, it works by composing uh, linear regression with nonlinearities in between. So the parameterization of the deep learning space would look something like this, where each a is a linear operation if sigma is a nonlinearity and you stagger these together. If you do this from the point of view of an intermediate uh, linear operation, let's say A2, the features are adaptive. So that's a good point. Another good point is that you have a universal approximation theorem for this construct. You can approximate any function to arbitrary precision given uh, enough computational power. However, uh, this, this gives very flexible models and it's hard to offer guarantees for how well it will generalize to NSYNC data. That's the first problem. Uh, another problem is that, of course, this, uh, this is non-convex. So we have a non-convex problem in very high dimension. So that's something which is pretty hard to optimize. You cannot expect to have good convergence guarantees for this type of algorithm and for uh, people who like very rigorous proof, well, it's not very pleasant. For instance, a very flat valley in the high dimensional space is something that's hard to optimize. Okay, so we have adaptive features, but it's hard to optimize and uh, generalization is poorly understood. <coughs> that's, that's it for the deep learning example. So back to some images, that's how you could draw uh, a simple fully connected deep network, so each column <coughs> it's going to be, each column is going to be uh, a layer and each circle inside a layer is going to be a feature. So in a fully connected network, each feature here uh, is connected to all the features in the previous layers. Each, each arrow is uh, an individual weight that you're trying to learn. Okay? So you stack these linear operations with nonlinearities in between and you have a lot of parameters there. Uh, too many parameters is a bad thing. And in practice, these networks don't work for in a lot of cases. Uh, the convolutional networks, on the other hand, are an improvement on this. The idea is that uh, we're going to reduce the, uh, the amount of weights in the network. So it's going to work like this. Let's say the, the square in the middle uh, is your input. Okay. So this is the input. Um, now, to compute a feature, instead of taking the full input, we're going to focus on a small region, so that's going to be the blue, uh, the blue square here. We're only going to look at this part of the input, and we're going to perform, again, a linear operation with a classification kernel here. Uh, so, we apply the vector product of these two things, and we get one feature, okay, the square here. And now that we've done this, we will slide the kernel by one pixel to the right, and also down. 
and that will give us the whole map of outputs here. So if we go back to the previous drawing, uh, we could draw it like this, but then most of the arrows would disappear, there would be zeros, and the ones that don't disappear would be repeated many times. Okay? So that's the idea behind uh, convolutional uh, networks. It's a lot of weight sharing, and also uh, it's done in a way that implements translation invariance. So let's say in my inputs, uh, my input is an image and I have a car in the top left corner, here, uh, I will get a feature. If I give you the same input with uh, the same car translated into the bottom corner, you will get almost the same output, the same output, but translated. So it implements translation invariance. So these features are very simple, but you compute many of them in parallel, and then you stack them, which makes, in the end, a very expressive model. Okay. Uh, so for those who didn't know this, here is a detail of how it happens. Uh, beyond the picture, so we take we take part of the inputs, the kernel, uh, we compute a vector product, and then we slide the window to the right, and that will give us the second feature, etc., etc. Okay. Okay, I think that's clear. Um, there is another basic building block in convolutional networks. It's the pooling operation because these inputs are high dimensional, so these computations are expensive, you would want to reduce the spatial dimensionality of your feature maps. And the way to do this, well, one way to do this is to use pooling. So you focus on, again, a subset of, uh, of the inputs, and you will reduce the dimensionality by picking the maximum of the, of the activations. So this will indeed reduce the spatial dimension of your feature map, it will also, as you stack such pooling operation, it will increase the receptive field much faster. Okay? Because uh, if you look at this red square here, uh, now this, this feature has a receptive field of 4 in the previous feature map. If you do this many times, it's going to increase to 8, etc., etc. So this increases the receptive field. It also gives robustness to small variation. If you slightly uh, shift your input image, for instance, uh, the features will vary slightly, but this will probably be uh, compensated by the max pooling. So it, will, it gives a bit of robustness to small variations. Okay, that's it. So we have two basic building blocks, the convolution and the pooling operation. So back to our drawing, we stack these operations. Uh, so we also have to put nonlinearities in between. Nonlinearities in between, as we said. So for instance, it could be a function here that is zero... Uh, below zero, and that is the identity function after zero. That's very simple, it's nonlinear, and it's what is used often in practice. So this whole stack of layers you can train end-to-end -end by gradient descent. So to compute the, it's a, it's a composition of simple functions, so you can compute uh, derivatives by applying uh, the chain rule. So that's here, pretty simple. There is an efficient way of computing this chain rule, which is called the backpropagation algorithm. I'm not going to detail it. But let's assume we can compute, we can efficiently compute gradients with any weights, with respect to any weights in this, uh, in this big network. Okay. So, we say that this network is used to build more and more uh, complex, flexible representation of the data. There, there are ways of visualizing what the network learns. So, for instance, what you could do is pick one feature somewhere in the network and try to, uh, again, by gradient descent, build the input that maximizes the response of this given feature. If you do this picking uh, features at the beginning of the network, somewhere here, and try to get uh, the input that maximally excites it, you will uh, see something like edges. So, early in the network, you have something that looks like an edge detector. If you go a bit further, uh, you will find textures, uh, then you will find patterns, then you will find parts of objects, and eventually you might even end up with full objects that appear a bit everywhere in the image because it needs to be translation invariant. I mean, because of the translation invariant, sorry. So yeah, this illustrates that the network is able to build more and more complex features. And in fact, if you wanted to hand engineer this type of feature, yeah. Uh, I, I said invariance, I should have said equivariance, first of all, yeah, equivariance, and, and what, sorry? Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, okay. Yep, so equivariance. Same answer, but translated. Uh, yeah, so if you look at these features, uh, it would be very hard to engineer, hard to handle. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, and there are a few questions. The question of clarification regarding convolution. So if you have like convolution, like one filter to one input, you get one output. And how do you, how is it done in practice that you have, let's say, three inputs and uh, seven outputs? So you're, um, ah, okay, channels, I see. Uh, so indeed, here we have a single input image. Uh, here we have a single input in image, but in fact it's an RGB image. So it has a spatial dimension, let's say height and width, maybe 32 by 32, and it also has three color channels. Uh, and so indeed, my drawings were only spatial, but in fact the kernels, uh, so the kernel is a small square here, but it also has a depth dimension, okay? So in fact, this curve, yeah, it's a linear operation, but in fact it has size, let's say, three by three by three. It's, so it's a... It's the same weight repeated for every output feature, uh, feature in the in output in the, in the next layer. So if you're computing, uh, let's say, this first output feature map here, uh, you will use one kernel, okay? And for the next uh, feature, you will use another kernel, <coughs> all right? So each kernel is three-dimensional, and you have as many kernels as you have features in the output layer. Not here? Uh, yeah, but how do you... Uh, what does it mean this depth dimension? So you just uh, average and later, or how do you... Mm, uh, you can, you can, so you probably start from three channels because it's an RGB image. Uh, and then you can choose arbitrarily how many features you want for the next layer. And you can go from, at, at one point you could decide that you have maybe 128 feature channels and you suddenly go, go back to one. This is completely up to you. In practice, there are rules that, are like, what works best usually is to double the number of uh, feature channels every time you divide the spatial resolution by two. That's the rule of thumb that people use. But of course, at the end, you want a single answer, so you will have to, you will need a reduction in the number of channels. Yeah. But typically, you have many channels in the intermediate layers. But we can discuss it more at the end if you want. Okay. So, we build uh, more and more complex features, and when we visualize them, it's pretty clear that it would be hard to, to hand engineer this kind of features. So, this kind of illustrates the power of deep networks. Okay, so let's wrap up this introduction. So the core idea is that you have many, uh, many layers of processing that go from a row input from row input to the output, and uh, the features are built together with the classification. So the features are adapted. That's the core idea. Uh, in practice, uh, this strategy has already been applied successfully to quite a few domains. So for vision, well. Object detection is now uh, pretty efficient on many data sets. Speech and NLP, you can think about uh, personal assistants like Alexa. Uh, games, you can think about uh, the AlphaGo uh, and AlphaZero bots that, uh, that beat uh, champions at Go, or uh, StarCraft or Dota. So it works in uh, different scenarios, which shows that there is some, something right in this approach. Uh, the industry has already adapted this construction for, uh, for many large-scale applications, Google, Facebook. Uh, in practice, there is a huge drawback to these approaches, is that they are very uh, demanding in terms of computation, and they also require a lot of data to train. Uh, it means in deep learning arena, if you're an individual, it's probably going to be hard to beat a big company with a lot of computational resources and a lot of data. In theory, uh, it's less rosy. The optimization of these networks is still very poorly understood. The generalization properties and guarantees of these networks is also very poorly understood, and so experimental results are quite ahead of the theoretical understanding that we have of way it works. So there's work to be done there, if it's possible. Okay, that's it for, uh, for the introduction to deep learning. Let's, uh, let's now... Uh, start shifting to an application domain, which is a uh, genetic model. And let's start by discussing unsupervised deep learning. 
Um, why would you want to do unsupervised learning? So as we said, one drawback of supervised learning is that you need a lot of uh, label data to train the models. Uh, the thing is, this data, well, obtaining data, images, for instance, on the internet, it's almost free. There's enormous amounts of data, and it's easy to get. The problem is, usually, when you find a photo on the internet, it doesn't come with a description of what's inside the photo, and that's actually the expensive part. If you want to get label data, that's very expensive, and yet it's key to training, uh, to training good models. That's where you may hope that unsupervised learning could help. Uh, essentially, what you'll try to do is invent a task and try to learn powerful representation from unlabeled data. And unlabeled data, as, as we said, you can have plenty of it. So you'll hopefully build a very big model on this unlabeled data and use the representations that it learned somehow to improve your performance in a supervised setting, such that you will need uh, less labeled data. Okay, that's one motivation from, for uh, unsupervised learning. Um, so, one type of unsupervised learning is generative models, trying to uh, learn the distribution of the data that you're given. That's the task. Try to model the distribution of the data. Uh, first, it's interesting because it makes for a good sandbox research problem. As we say, the data is abundant and free. Uh, and it's also a pretty complex problem, modeling the density, uh, the true density that is behind the generation of natural images. That's something that's highly nonlinear, that has a lot of diversity, so it's a complex problem. So complex problem, lots of data to solve it. That's a good sandbox uh, research problem. Also, in terms of application, once you have an unconditional generative model, let's say you're able to generate images, uh, Conditioning of something is the easy part. So using this, you'll be able to, uh, to build the products, if you want, quite easily. One, one example could be if you have a good image of models, then it's easy to condition on a grayscale version of the image and ask for the color back. Or you could uh, think about in painting. You could remove a part of an image. Let's say you were taking a, a photo, but a tourist walks in the frame. You can cut the tourist out and ask that the model regenerates the picture without the tourist. Uh, colorization of old fields. Uh, yeah, there are many others. So the idea is once you have an unconditional model, conditioning is the easy part. Okay. So let's compare supervised learning to unsupervised learning. So in supervised learning, let's uh, review, that's what we already said. You were given an input and you train a model to maximize the probability of your desired answer or label. Okay? And you're looking for the parameters that will maximize this probability or log probability. Uh, in unsupervised learning, you don't have labels, and the task is to learn the density of the image. So you're trying to maximize the probability of observing the data that you did indeed observe. It's pretty reasonable. You don't need labels. Uh, and the thing is, there's another thing that you could do, it's a bit in between, uh, between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. If you try to do supervised, sorry, supervised learning with unlabeled data, so that seems a bit like a paradox, the trick is in fact to invent, it, to invent a task. So you take your data and try to extract some structure from the data, that's the high level idea, and use the structure that you extracted as a target, such that you can perform uh, supervised learning with this newly acquired target. So an example of this would be, let's say that I take a text on the internet and I select a word, WT, uh, and I can also look at which words are around it. And now my task will be, uh, given this input word here, predict the context in which it was used. So it will be the surrounding words. So you see this target, uh, I don't need anyone to give it to me, I can extract it for free from the, from the data that I collected on the internet. Still, it's a target, so now I can use uh, supervised learning tools to solve this task. Okay? Uh, another instance could be uh, I could take an image, <coughs> cut it into tiles. Um, first, always pick the central tile, then pick another tile at random. So here is the year. And I could ask the network to predict where this tile was uh, placed origin in the original image with respect to uh, the first image. And it will have to say, well, it should be here. Okay. 
to solve this task, you expect that the network has to understand some, something about the structure of natural images, right? It's not that easy. If you don't know what a cat is, it's going to be hard to say that the, the ear should go to the top right. Okay. So that's another uh, example. Other examples could be, uh, you're given the video, you shuffle the frames, and ask the model to find the right ordering for the frames again. That's another way of extracting free labels. Or it could be image invading. Remove a part of an image and ask to predict it again. Okay. So the idea here is that we're using supervised training on the proxy tasks that we invented and we extracted the labels automatically. Once we have this network, we will fine tune on the task that we actually wanted to solve. We have less training data because we've already learned something useful. Okay. So that's definitely a supervised representation learning, which performs the first goal. Uh, the downside of this approach is that you have to invent a pretext task, okay? So let's say it's uh, reordering the tiles. Your model will be trained to solve this task. And so it will focus on the information that is relevant to solving the task and throw, throw away the rest. And it may be that in the information that you throw away, uh, there's something that would have been useful to solve the task that you actually want to solve in the end. So that's the drawback of, uh, of this approach. You invent a pretext task and it's not clear how much solving this pretext task is going to be relevant to your final goal, okay? In contrast, uh, generative models, you may expect that they don't suffer from this roadmap. Why? Because their task is to model the data, uh, to predict it with low, uh, low entropy, low uncertainty, and to do this, well, in some sense, it's equivalent to understanding the data. What you, can, what you understand, you can predict easily. So in this case, we don't expect the model to throw information away so much because the task is to understand it as well as possible. So, uh, model as much as you can. That's it. Uh, so it's still a supervised training. We don't have a target. So the parameters of our model, we will be able to estimate them using unlabeled data. And we also get something at the end. It's that since it's a generative model, we can draw samples. So we can invent applications for that. And that's an example of, uh, of a model trained on, uh, on images. So these are the training samples, and these are samples generated by the model. Okay. So, uh, let's go into generative modeling basics. What's the first generative model that uh, one could build? Well, a, uh, a reasonable choice could be a, Gaussian, a mixture of Gaussians. So in a mixture of Gaussians, you have uh, several Gaussian densities written here. Uh, you have many of them, and to get the density again, you make a weighted average with the weights sum into one. Very simple. So it could look something like this. If each of the Gaussian would be a blue curve, and the overall distribution would be the red one. As you add components to your mixture, the model becomes more complicated. Okay? Um, okay, so how to train these things? Uh, one way of doing this is to use the expectation maximization algorithm, the intuition, is that you proceed in two steps. In the first step, uh, you assign data points to a cluster, so you use it to, to one component of the mixture. And in the second step, you update the centroid of each, uh, uh, of each component to better fit the data that was attributed to it. This procedure is non convex like neural networks, but it's been used for a while and it's pretty well understood. Okay. How do you sample from this model? It's pretty easy. First, you have to sample a component. So uh, you have probabilities of picking each component. You can sample from that. And once you have one component, well, it's just a Gaussian, so we know how to sample from a Gaussian. And that will give samples uh, from the whole distribution. So it's easy to sample. It's also easy to compute analytically because it's a finite sum. OK, next thing one could do, <coughs> slightly more complicated, but not much. Uh, is to still start from a latent representation, Z. Uh, but this time, draw it from a Gaussian. So, very simple, maybe the simplest density that one could think of, well, except a uniform. Uh, then, once we have this latent representation, we map it with the linear transformation here. Okay. That gives us a new value. And to obtain a density again, we fit a Gaussian around, uh, I mean, we put a Gaussian around this value. That will give us a density, okay? And we, could, and we can do this for any z. So we can integrate out uh, 
over z, and that would give us again the density over x that we wanted. So this is called probabilistic principal component analysis. Analysis. So in PCA, the goal is to reduce, or the goal usually is to reduce the dimensionality of the data. So how does this happen here? Uh, if you select, if you decide that the W should have very few columns, and so the z very few lines, you'll try to reconstruct uh, your input x, but using much fewer dimensions. So that's how it's going. It's going to focus on the most important directions in the space. And then the information that you lost, uh, you, will co uh, you will compensate by adding some noise uh, around your manifold. Okay? To compensate for the, th the information that you threw away, in a sense. Okay, so you can train this by single, singular value decomposition, or again using the expectation maximization algorithm. Again, sampling is easy. Just start by uh, sampling from your prior, then apply a linear transformation, uh, and then sample from this new distribution that you got. It's a Gaussian, you know how to do that. All right. So these two simple approaches have something in common. They are both linear transformations starting from a latent representation. So the latent representation you got is Z. Uh, in, the, in the first case, with mixture models, it's just a random one-hot vector, so it just says which component we should choose. And in the second case, there's a linear transformation, starting from a unit Gaussian. Okay? In both cases, it's a linear transformation, and that leads... Uh, oh yeah, one last thing, it's important to have, uh, in both cases we have a Gaussian around this transformed Z. And this is important because uh, when you compute the likelihood of you de your data, you want something that is non-degenerate. Uh, when you're learning your manifold by reshaping Z, you're going to make mistakes. So the training data, you're going to learn a manifold, and your training data is never going to be perfectly on the manifold. So if you don't add some volume there, uh, the likelihood of your data will always be zero. So that's why you need the Gaussian. You need to add some volume here to cover the full space so that you never have degenerate support. Okay, so linear transformation plus some volume around the manifold. Finally, you can interpret this as a reconstruction. Why? Uh, because this density that we have here is Gaussian, so if we take the log likelihood, the negative log likelihood, it's the same as an L2 loss. Uh, that's what you get, roughly. And this measures, oh, it was written below. Um, this measures how well you reconstructed your input. Okay? That's how you can interpret it. All right. So now, uh, how do we apply these ideas in a deep learning scenario? I guess you, you can guess that the goal with deep learning is going to uh, to move away from the linear transformation. We'll try to learn a high-dimensional, non-linear uh, manifold starting from Z. So here, we are in a low dimension, well, in the space of dimension 2, from which we sample our Z. Then, uh, we will... Yeah, okay, it's, it's also sampled, so we can keep the idea of sampling Z from the Gaussian. And now we want to reshape the simple Gaussian density, okay? So we make it go through a non-linear, potentially very flexible mapping, and this will give us a nonlinear manifold uh, in a higher dimensional space. So it's going to be a low dimensional manifold, but it's going to be very flexible. Okay? So you could represent it like this. Uh, you start from Z here, apply many nonlinear transformations, and at the end, you hope that you're able to model highly nonlinear data such as uh, images of faces. Okay? So that's what we want to do. Reshape a simple density using very flexible nonlinear transformations. This will give us a very complex marginal distribution of X. We need this to model natural images. Uh, to, see it, to see this, well, as we say, uh, PZ is taken from uh, a simple density. But when you compute the marginal on, the, on X, uh, this term here is very complex. So, on one hand, that's good, because 
you have, in fact, arbitrarily flexible output densities. But it also raises a problem, because now the computation of uh, equation, equation 13 uh, becomes intractable. Before, we could uh, have an analytical form, but because this term is highly nonlinear, we're never going to get uh, an, an analytical form for this term here. And so we cannot compute the integral. So now we don't have access to the, the main quantity that we were trying to optimize, and that's of course a problem. Okay? So, you could think about Monte Carlo estimation. This is a highly complex integral, we can compute it, okay, fine. But we can sample many z's, for each z, compute the quantity inside the integral, average, and say that it's a good approximation of the integral. And that's a good idea. The problem is, uh, we're in a very high dimensional space, natural images. So, to get a good Monte Carlo approximation, you need a huge number of samples. And, yes? Yeah. Z is in the space, some space. Yeah, so maybe space. X in the picture. Yes. And the time of Z is last layer. It's yeah, yeah, the last layer of a deep network, sure. So it's a, it's a nonlinear manifold and it's low dimensional in the space of natural images. Okay? So as we said before, you need to add some volume around this nonlinear manifold to have a non degenerate supports. Okay? Cool. Um, yeah, so Monte Carlo approximation of this integral, a good idea, but in high dimension it's going to have huge variance or it's going to require so many samples that it's going to be extremely slow and you'll never train your model. So we can't use that. Okay. And in fact, answering this question, how do we deal with uh, this very complex integral, there's several answers that you can give and it will lead to uh, different models that people use in practice. So the first solution that we'll see today is to uh, approximate this integral using variational inference to obtain an evidence lower bound. That's the idea between variational autoencoders. Second class of model of the trains the generative model uh, without using this integral altogether. They just avoid uh, looking at this integral. So that's what, in, in one way, that's how you could pre present GANs. Generative adversarial networks, sorry. A third solution would be to constrain the family of f theta in a way that we can still compute uh, p theta of x. Okay? Um, so p, uh, f theta here is still going to be something deep and flexible, but it will be constrained to a family where the computation of this quantity is easier. Okay? And the fourth solution is to not use latent variables at all. Maybe we don't have to have this vector z. So under a latent uh, variable generative model, but it might still work. We'll see. All right. So uh, I'll start by speaking about solution two, and it's uh, generative adversarial networks. So recall that our main our main goal is to sample from a simple distribution uh, on Z, and uh, reshape it using a nonlinear function to obtain you know, a nonlinear uh, manifold. So, how are we going to train? In the, in the case of GANs, uh, we completely, so now that we have a sample, we, we would need to evaluate how good this sample is, okay? We sampled from our prior, we shaped it, uh, we need to evaluate the quality of this potential image. And ideally, if we had access to P-star, the true density that generated the images, we would just evaluate this to uh, give a score to our sample. But of course, we don't have access to P-star because that's precisely what we're trying to learn. So instead, GANs use a classifier. Uh, the, the, the classifier will be a deep network that is tasked with, with assigning a probability to the image of being real or fake. So it will have to judge this image and say how good it thinks it is. It will output a probability uh, between 0 and 1, 0 being absolutely certain <coughs> that this image is fake, and 1 being absolutely certain that this image is true. So, yeah, you have a classification problem, you give samples and real images, and you ask your discriminator to tell you if they're true or if they're fake. It's pretty simple conceptually. Uh, so you could represent it like this. So, uh, to generate your images, as we said, you'll start from sampling uh, from the prior, then you will use a deep network that in this case we call a generator to get a sample. 
you also have some real images that you collected, and you will feed, uh, well, I could say real here and fake here. Okay. You will feed those real and fake images to the discriminator and ask them to tell you if it's true or if it's fake. Okay. And you will evaluate it. <coughs> so the generator is trained, the discriminator is, tra is trained to separate true and fake samples. And the goal of the generator is to fool the discriminator. Your goal is to produce good samples, and your evaluation of what a good sample is is the score given by your discriminator. So the task of the generator is to confuse the discriminator. And if it manages to do so, hopefully it means it has managed to produce samples that look perfectly real. Okay, so how is, what is the discriminator going to look like? It's going to look like exactly what we described before. It's going to be based on a classifier, so we're going to stack uh, convolution and pooling operations. The only difference here is that it's not going to be uh, trying to give you classes, but only, I mean, not going to try to recognize the object, but it will have two classes, real and fake. Okay. So we can use the knowledge that we acquired in building uh, discriminators, uh, building classifiers for this. All right. Uh, so now let's speak about the generator. Typically, First, for the prior, you'll pick a space that is uh, of dimension linearity between 100 and 1,000 dimensions. And you'll try to generate an image from this. So in terms of architecture, it will look very similar to the discriminator, but symmetric. Okay? You start from uh, something that has low spatial resolution, and you try to upsample this to an image. So instead of pooling operations, uh, you will have operations that increase the resolution of the image. So you could do this with nearest neighbor of sampling, uh, building your interpolation, or you could even learn an operation that it's a of samples. But the idea is that you have to increase the resolution of the image. That's what happens in between each of these blocks. Okay? And then these blocks are just convolutions, very similar to what we saw before. Normal convolutions, they don't change the, sp the spatial resolution of the image. So very similar to the discriminator in symmetry. <laughs> Uh, the low resolution layers, the first ones in the network, they're going to be used to induce correlations, uh, long range correlations between the pixels. So, if you're generating a car, you need the top left corner of the car and the bottom right corner to be maybe of the same color, and that's going to happen early in the network. Whereas, high, uh, lower, uh, later layers in the network, they'll be able to induce correlations, uh, short range correlations. So, they will be dedicated to uh, things like patterns, textures. Yeah. Okay, so back to the initial drawing. Uh, we have a discriminator that tries to maximally separate the two types of images, and the generator that tries to confuse the discriminator. Uh, so your sample C, well, they go quite a long way. They start from here, they have to go through the generator to become samples, and then they have to go through the discriminator to be classified. So if these two networks are very deep, the whole construction is even deeper. And you have to, to train this, you have to compute the gradients, so you have to backpropagate all the way. So the signal that trains the generator is backpropagated through the discriminator. Okay? Uh, so you can see this, you can, you can see this as building a trainable loss function. If your purpose is to train a good generator, you need a loss to train this generator, classical way would be to use a reconstruction loss, but in the, in the case of GANs, you're in fact training the loss, as, as, as far as the generator is concerned. Your loss is going to be the answer of this whole block, and it's a deep network. So you're training the loss that you would use to train the generator. That's a big difference with other approaches, which tend to use uh, fixed losses. So, uh, let's look at, in a, at a toy example of what could happen as you train uh, again. So you will start from uh, a data distribution, that's going to be the black dots here, and you will have a model that is not perfect, but it's not too bad either. Okay, let's, let's say we've already trained it a little bit. So you see, it, there, there is an area where the model is right, uh, it misses another area, and uh, it invents uh, another one. In the beginning, the discriminator, it's the blue curve, uh, won't be perfect. If you update 
if you keep the generator fixed and update the discriminator to optimality, you expect to see something like this. So in the region where uh, both models agree, it doesn't really know. And outside of this region, it, it can classify with good accuracy fake samples and uh, real images here. Okay. So we've updated our discriminator. Now we can update our generator. Uh, and of course, the generator will try to get scores with a higher, well, higher scores. So it's going to look at this region and say, well, if I go there, I'm going to get good scores. So yeah, that pushes the model in this direction. Then you update again your discriminator, your generator. You do this many times until hopefully you reach uh, the situation where the generator produces perfect images, and so the discriminator cannot tell them apart and just outputs one half all the time. So that's why it's a flat line. Yep. So that's what you hope happens when you when you train again. So let's look at the equations. Uh, so v of uh, phi theta is going to be the performance. Uh, of our discriminator. So as you see, so it depends on phi and on theta. Phi is going to be the weight of the discriminator, and theta is going to be the weight of the generator. Okay. So from the point of view of the discriminator, there's two types of images that can appear. They can be sampled from the data, or they can be sampled from the generative model. Okay. If they come from the data, then the generator has to say that they are real. So we wants to maximize uh, the answer 1. So we'll try to maximize d of x, and in fact, log of d of x, why not? It's a monotonic function. Uh, and for phase samples, we want to maximize the probability of getting a 0. So the objective for, uh, for the discriminator will be to output 0. That's, one, that's why it's 1 minus the prediction here. To be maximum, this thing will, be, will have to be close to 0. So this loss is shared in a way by the discriminator and the generator, but the discriminator tries to maximize it and the generator tries to minimize it. If it's small, it means the discriminator is confused. If we assume that we have arbitrarily flexible models and that we're able to train them perfectly, uh, and that at each iteration where we update the generator and then the discriminator was trained to optimality just before, uh, then we can prove that there is a unique optimum for G, and it's exactly the data distribution. So in that sense, this framework makes sense. You know, if you assume that you can train everything perfectly, there is only one answer, the true distribution. That's good. <coughs> and you have a convergence to an optimum that is guaranteed. But that's in a very ideal scenario. But okay, at least in an ideal scenario, it works. Um, okay, so let's say we fix the generator. Uh, you can show that in that case, the optimal discriminator will have a value that is equal to the base classifier uh, between the two. So it will be the ratio of uh, the, the image being real versus the sum of the two scores. Uh, to see that it's correct, you can think about what happens if PG is exa exactly P data. Uh, then this will be equal to one half. Okay? So it doesn't know. It just attributes equal probability to, uh, to both classes. Uh, we can look at the proof uh, briefly. So this is uh, this is the loss that we wrote before. We can rewrite it as an integral here, uh, and this is in fact. So let's say this is this term here is a. Uh, what did I write here? This is y. This is one minus y, and this is b. Okay. If you differentiate this function and try to see where the zero gradient here uh, are you will get this, which means you either reach the goal, uh, a maximum or a minimum, and in fact it's a maximum. Uh, and when you replace A, B, and Y by the quantities that I just erased, you get this. So, okay. But you can check the slides again for the proof. But it's easy to prove. If we, if we re-inject this optimal value in the original uh, loss, we get this quantity, a constant plus two jensen shannon divergence. Uh, I mean, no, two, two, two times the jensen shannon divergence. And the jensen shannon divergence is equal to a sum of two pullback-Liebler divergence. Uh, 
and the important point here is that uh, they are reversed. This one here has the P on the left, and this one has the Q on the left. So this scale here is an integral on samples, something, and this one here is an integral on, uh, oh, sorry, it's the opposite. No, it's the sample, the real. Okay. Uh, so that means the discriminator, that's, that comes from the fact that the discriminator is trained, to, it has to, uh, so to give scores to both real and fake images. And it's a distinction with maximum likelihood, which would have only one sided KL. Okay, I'm not going to say more on this. Um, as we said, you need global optimum for this loss. It's when P data is equal to PG. Um, yeah. So how do you train with this loss in practice? You see that it has uh, it has infinite uh, integrals over infinite uh, quantities because they're continuous. So of course, in practice, we'll have to replace these integrals by expectations. We'll take a finite number of samples, many batches of samples, and we will approximate these integrals uh, over uh, by by the scores on these mini batches. Uh, and we will do gradient descents on the parameters of each network using these unbiased approximations of the true gradients. Okay, uh, if we train like this, so here is a, an example of, a model, of an early model, it's from 2016. Uh, now you get much better results, but that's uh, what they could show. Uh, so yeah, they were able to train uh, faces that are not bad at all, actually uh, we're very demanding in terms of face quality, so we can tell that they're not real, but they're not that bad. More modern networks uh, achieve more impressive results. So of course, these are not these results are not comparable. With net these results were obtained with a much cheaper network trained on many GPUs, uh, and also it's class conditional. So the network has knowledge of which class of object it should generate. So that helps a lot. But you can see that these pictures, well, they're all, they're also cherry picked, of course, but they look very real and in, and they're in a high dimension. So. These networks really can sometimes uh, generate very convincing samples, and that's not easy at all. This is very recent. Okay. Uh, so another thing that we can do to see what the GAN has learned uh, is to take two images, so that will give us Z1 and Z2, and now we can draw a line between these two points and linearly interpolate and regularly sample a new Z, and from this new Z generates a new image. Okay, uh, so what do you expect to see? Well, if the model has learned something useful, you expect to see a smooth transition from one image to the other. That means it has understood the data. If it has just memorized uh, images that were in the training data without learning something useful, you expect to see sharp transitions. So for a whole region of the subspace, it will produce one image, and when you jump to the other region, it jumps to the other image. So that's one way of checking that the network has learned something useful. GANs are not easy to evaluate, so you have to resort to tricks like this. So here's an early example from, uh, from Radford et al., uh, where they take two images of bedroom and linearly interpolate, and you can see that the bedroom on the left slowly transforms to the bedroom on the right. These images are not perfect, but you know, it's very it's really nonlinear transition, so the model has learned something useful. At the time, these results were quite surprising. Here is another example with the much more modern network. It's more impressive. Um, so the images in, in the middle, they tend to not look like much. But actually, when you think about it, that is to be expected, because we're interpolating from images from one class, a dolphin, to an image from another class, a dog. It's not very clear how you would smoothly transition from being a dolphin to being a dog, dog. Probably in the true data generating distribution that we don't know, there are probably separate modes with uh, zero probability in between in the space. Um, yeah, because there is nothing in between being a dolphin and between being a dog. So that explains why the model will tend to produce things that don't look like real animals like this. And to solve this, you probably need uh, discrete latent variables in your code. So we are working with continuous latent variables, but if you also had discrete ones, then you could 
take this great decision, which would be which mode of the data am I in right now? So I can switch sharply from being a dolphin to being a bird. This model only has yes. Uh, maybe I, I couldn't be here yesterday, unfortunately, so I, I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Maybe we can discuss it afterwards, so, but we will definitely. Yeah? Uh, how difficult is it to have some constraints on that? Add constraints on the generation, such as what? Let's say, equal generation. Go from one bird to another. Yes. And we always say there has to be some heat. To have to be some what, sir? Some heat in the. Yeah, okay. Okay, so maybe, or maybe you want to say where the peak, where, where the peak of the bird should be in the image. Yeah. That would be an example. Yeah, okay. So that's that would be one way to do this. Probably, uh, well, you would have two ingredients. The first is you would condition your model. So for now, we're working with unconditional models, uh, but you could provide some extra information as an input to your generator, and that would be the locations of the peak or the class that you want to generate, or some other type of uh, information. Typically, it would be a label that you concatenate to your code. Is that clear? That would be the first ingredient. Uh, and then, of course, you also have to evaluate whether your model is using this information or not. So you would add a term to the loss that looks at whether you indeed use the, inf the extra information. If you can, in some cases, you can't add a term to the loss. Uh, so this, this a lot of well, I don't have examples to show you, but uh, there are a lot of papers doing this, precisely generating birds by uh, with key point locations, for instance, so let's say I want the tail to be here, the beak to be here, and birds. Yeah. I can't show you images, but it's doable. It's not too hard. If you know how to train an unconditional GAN, conditioning is not too hard. Okay. Yeah. These are samples, in fact. This, uh, yeah, yeah. This model is very good. It's able. Well, I showed you pictures before. These images are samples. So what they took, they simply took samples, kept track of. Oops, sorry, kept track of uh, the latents, and then interpolated. If you wanted to start from a, a real image and interpolate between two real images, there are models that do this. But it means you also need an inference network. You need a network that takes an image and gives you a latent. In the vanilla GAN case, you don't have that. So you have no way of taking a real image and saying, please give me the latent representation of this particular image, so you cannot interpolate between two real images. Okay? But you could if you had an inference network, and a lot of models have that. Good question. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. Another thing that you could do is uh, see if you can perform some, some arithmetic on the latent representations. So let's say, uh, you sample many images, then find the images of three men with glasses. You average over this real representation so that you hope uh, to like, reduce variance. That gives you another man with glasses. You can do the same for men without glasses. You can try to subtract the two latent representations, and you can hope that this will give you a representation of what it means to have glasses. Then you can compute an average representation of women without glasses, Add back the first vector that you computed, and you hope to get a woman with glasses. And to some extent, it works. It doesn't work with everything, but uh, yeah, this is an early paper as well. You could get better things now. So that's interesting. The latent space has learned some, uh, some linear, I mean, you can do some linear operations in the latent space, which of course you couldn't do in the image space. So it has linearized some concepts, such as wearing glasses. That's interesting. Okay, one big issue with GANs that we will discuss a bit more uh, tomorrow is that they are very hard to, evalu to evaluate, basically because the, the straightforward way of evaluating samples would be to compute P star, uh, which we don't have. We don't even have access to the probability assigned by the model, in fact. So, it's hard to evaluate these things. One, one, one approach to doing this, like let's say you want to use a test set, so you take unseen images, and you would like to know 
what probability your model associates to these so far unseen images. You have no straightforward way of doing this with again, whereas with VA you would. Uh, one way of doing this could be to take uh, to take many samples and put small Gaussians around them so that you have a density with full support in the image space and evaluate uh, the probability of your test images under this new distribution. Basically, that's the idea behind parsing windows. And in low dimensional data, it could work. People have tried doing it with GANs, but then other works show that it's very unreliable and you could expect this because the space is so high dimensional, this is going to be very precise. So it works very poorly in high dimension. So people came up with other ways of evaluating GANs, but it remains a challenging question. Also, of course, if you do this, you're actually building a different model, and that's the one you're actually evaluating. So you're not really evaluating your GAN, you're evaluating uh, a mixture of Gaussians centered on the finite number of samples from a GAN. It's not exactly the same. Okay. Uh, so they're hard to evaluate, they're also pretty hard to train in practice, in fact. So there are many reasons for this. Uh, the first thing is that they're well, this problem, as we saw, is uh, formulated as a min-max objective between two networks. So, it's not complex, of course, as everything in deep learning. But you also see that the optimization can oscillate between solutions. Maybe, let's say, uh, the generator becomes very good at... You have a data set with cars and boats. And the generator becomes very good at generating cars. But it only generates cars. So the discriminator will learn to reject the cars that it sees, and it will have better than random performance. So the generator might move away to generating boats, but if it forgets about cars, uh, this thing will just cycle endlessly. Of course, I'm giving a very simple example here, but you can see how it could cycle between, uh, between modes of the data, basically. So that's a problem. We can't guarantee that it won't. Yep. So we, uh, uh, the, the proof, uh, so the, the proof, I didn't exactly prove it, but the thing is it was under the assumption that at each iteration you train your model to optimality and that you have infinite flexibility, so it was under very strong assumptions that we know how to train well. So in that setting, the, the proof is, is, is correct. The problem is that in practice, for instance, the generator will never cover all the modes of the data. Maybe because there's too many of them and our model is not flexible enough, let's say. In that case, you will cover a few modes uh, and you might, as you learn new modes, you might forget the previous ones and cycle endlessly between, between them. Yeah. But that's in practice. Yeah. Of course, as your model becomes more flexible, as we progress and get more GPUs and train, uh, um, improve the way we train, uh, we will cover more and more modes and eventually it's going to be good enough. Uh, can, can you say that again, sorry? Discrete data. Um, so, yeah, formulated like this. Uh, so, what, what is discrete? Is it the, the images, for instance, or? Text, yeah. Yeah. So I, I know that people have been using GANs in, uh, in NLP. I've never usually really read uh, these papers, so... Okay. Yeah, okay, one way to deal with, uh, with uh, non-continuous... Yeah. Uh, I guess, yeah, you could also, you could also embed your words in, a, in an embedding space and have a continuous model there, and at the output discretize again, uh, then yeah, okay, how do you backpropagate? You could use the parameterization trick or reinforce. Uh, maybe we can discuss it later. I don't have a clear answer, so we'll take too long. Okay. 
Uh, okay, so training is complicated. Um, okay, in practice, it's important, uh, it's mutual to be important to have uh, generator and discriminator architectures that are a good match to each other. And typically, what it means is they should be approximately as flexible as one another. For instance, perfectly symmetric. Uh, this seems to be what works best. If the discriminator is too strong, uh, it is too good, and the generator never receives useful training signal. I'll explain this a bit more tomorrow. And conversely, if the generator is too good, uh, the discriminator can never discriminate, and so never gives useful feedback. That's high level intuition. But okay, in practice, you need compatible architectures, and that requires architecture search, which is time consuming and computation consuming. Uh, takes a lot of computation. Okay, um, so one typical failure mode of GANs is that they fail to capture part of the support of the training data. So they will typically output images that look very real, much better than most generative models, at least if you stay in a, in a computational setting that is not too expensive. But they will forget about part of the data. That can be a problem. If you provide very rich data sets, you want your model to model everything. If it's good, if it produces good images but forgets about most of your data, so then you've wasted a lot of information. So that's the main drawback with GAN. They tend to mode collapse, and as we said, we don't really have a, a good way of evaluating the extent to which the mode collapse. Uh, and so, finally, uh, the, the training loss that we're minimizing has nothing to do with our evaluation of how good the model is. And that's pretty unusual, usually in deep learning or in other machines machine learning methods, we try to minimize the loss that is very close to uh, the way we're going to evaluate the network. If I want to classify images, that's how I'm going to evaluate my network, that's also how, I, how I'm training it. In this case, the loss of the discriminator has nothing to do with our evaluation of the images. So that complicates things further. Yeah. Okay, that's it for the presentation of GANs. Let's, uh, let's now switch to another class of generative, deep generative model, the class of variational autoencoders. So you had very thorough presentation of variational inference. I'll, I'll stay quite light on, on, on this. Um, before speaking about variational autoencoders, let's first speak about autoencoders. So the goal of an autoencoder, uh, actually I'll give you 10 seconds break because we just switched topic. So. Uh, I, don't, no, no, I don't want you to stand up, I'm just uh, like giving a, a small break so that we can rest a bit. Okay, that was confusing, so I'll start again. <laughs> so in autoencoders, the goal is to build a latent represent representation starting from an image, trying to reconstruct it, but going through a latent representation that hopefully compresses information about the image. Uh, so we could represent it like this. Uh, we have an image X. We encode it into a lower dimensional, maybe, a representation of X and Z. And then from Z, we try to reconstruct the original X. Okay? Uh, that's what's written there. So this is... Uh, okay, and the loss to train this, uh, this, these two networks is a reconstruction loss. Okay? Uh, that's the idea behind PCA, okay? If our encoder here is linear and our decoder is also linear and our reconstruction loss is the L2 reconstruction loss, then we get exactly PCA. Now, in a deep learning setting, it could look something like this. We get the idea by now, we replace uh, linear transformation by a stack of linear transformation with non-linearities in between. So we start from X, go up, get a Z, Go up again, we construct X. But now we have many layers in between. So this is performing something like nonlinear representation learning. In the case of PCA, your code is a linear function of your input. In this case, it's going to be a nonlinear function, more flexible, harder to optimize. One remark about this is that this is not a generative model. Okay? You need a, uh, you see the arrows here, they go only one way. So you need an X generate a Z. And then once you have a Z, you can generate an X again. But if you didn't have an image in the first place, you're not generating an image. Okay? So if I just say, if I only do this drawing, it's not a generative model. Another remark is, uh, is that you need a kind of bot 
a kind of bottleneck here, a kind of information bottleneck. If you allow your encoder to keep all the information that, that is in X, uh, well, then it will throw any of it away, and then it's trivial to reconstruct X. Maybe the information gets, gets shifted around a little bit, uh, but your network might be able to learn an identity function. It will have perfect reconstruction, but it will be useless. So you always need an information bottleneck on, uh, on the state encoder here. So in the standard autoencoder case, let's say nonlinear PCA, uh, the bottleneck is the spatial dimension. Z is much smaller than X, so the network will have to focus on parts, uh, on the most important signal in X to perform well. Uh, but you could think about other types of bottlenecks, and if you don't have a bottleneck, it's going to be a degenerate setting, and your network won't learn something useful. Okay, so how do we move from autoencoders to a generative model? Um, so the first thing is, uh, instead of a, a deterministic mapping from Z to X, we will build uh, a density. So we will take X, uh, I mean, sorry, we will take Z, map it through a nonlinear function, do the same to obtain, uh, so we we'll do this to obtain a mean and a variance term, and that will be the parameters of the outlet. So now we, we went from a Z to a distribution to a density on X. Okay? Same thing for the encoder. We'll take, uh, we'll take an X, encode it into the mean and various parameters of the Gaussian, and this way we get a density as well. Could look like this. So you take an image of a cat, you encode it into a mean vector and a variance vector, and these are the parameters for, um, for your new density. And now you can sample from this density. Uh, so you sample the C, decode it through a deterministic mapping, and you get an average image or a distribution of the image. Okay. <clears throat> So, um, as you may remember, the, the quantity in, in light, maximum likelihood, the quantity that we're interested in, is the marginal likelihood over, yes? Um, on the previous slide, the, the networks for the mean and the variance is the same network. Yes, you, I mean, you could use two, why not? But uh, typically, you have one network and it has, it outputs two vectors. Yeah. So, up to the last layer, let's say everything is shared. And at the last moment, you use the penultimate layer, and you branch out into two different uh, two different vectors. But you could have two separate networks. Sounds a bit uh, wasteful, maybe, but why not? Okay. So the quantity of interest is this marginal likelihood that we are trying to compute. And as we said before, it's intractable because of uh, of the nonlinearity. Okay. So. We mentioned before that one could try using this. very well because I don't hear very well. So if I understand correctly, you're saying we could we could do representation learning using classical CNN. We don't yeah, need you... uh, I mean, yeah. Okay, so well first of all if you're I mean if you have a deep network and it's trained on the task, you can always hope that you can use the features as a data representation for for something else. But still each of these networks has a task. So in the case of uh, in, in the case of the autoencoder, it's specifically trained 
so that it compresses the data into a latent representation. It's the task of the network. So you can hope that this, this latent representation is a very good compression. Okay? You could also use the features learned by, a, let's say, classification CNN as a representation of X. But it won't have been trained for the sole purpose of compressing data, uh, for, compre uh, for the sole purpose of compressing information on X. Okay, it seems like I uh, Can we discuss this afterward? I'll try to answer better. Okay. So back to uh, our problem. We say the Monte Carlo estimation, first, let's say, solution you could think of, it doesn't work because it's too high dimensional. You could improve it. So let's try to build quickly because you had presentations of this uh, solution. You could improve it with weighted sampling. The idea is that in this integral here, if I do Monte Carlo sampling, most of the time, I'm going to sample a Z that is very unlikely to generate my X. Let's say I want to generate a car. Okay, I picked my X, it's a car. Uh, I go to latent space, I take random samples. Most of these samples will generate something else, a boat, a bicycle. And they will contribute very little, so they will have almost zero. They will give me a term that is almost zero here, so they will contribute very little to this integral. So I'm wasting my time sampling useless Zs. The idea of weighted sampling, is that I'm going to introduce a new quantity uh, here. And the goal of this quantity, it's also going to be a density on, on Z, but it's going to try to find the relevant Zs, okay? So most of them are useless, but I look at my image of a car and I try to put density in the space on Zs that are likely to generate a car. Uh, and now I can sample from this density instead, and I will waste less time. So, of course, for this to still be correct, I need to compensate. So, I multiply by this term, I divide here. But the key is that now I'm going to do my Monte Carlo estimation with respect to uh, this better posterior, okay? So, that's the first idea. Weighted sampling to improve the efficiency of my uh, Monte Carlo estimation. That's still not enough. It's still going to be too noisy. Uh, so, the second ingredient is to use variational inference uh, to construct the evidence lower bound. Uh, so, now we won't be optimizing log of p theta, we'll be optimizing the lower bound, but it will be more efficient. So let's derive it very quickly. So here I just rewrote the previous equation and I added the log around. Uh, so the next, next thing we can do is use uh, the Jensen inequality because the log is concave, so the log of the average is above the average of the logs. I'm averaging with respect to Q5, so that stays out of the log, and uh, the log moves inside the integral, and here I just copied everything. So that's just Jensen inequality. Next, but now we have an inequality here. So next thing we can do is uh, cut, this, cut this into two. So this part uh, will go there, okay? And I write it as an expectation, because it's, that's what it is. And this term here will go there. And it gets reversed because there, there's a minus. And I get a KL divergence, okay? Uh, all right, so that's going to be uh, one way of writing the evidence lower bound. So let's give a few comments. First of all, you can see that this lower bound has become a function of theta and phi. So it's a bit, uh, phi used to be the weight of the discriminator in the GAN presentation. Now it's the weight of the encoder. Okay? So we're trying to train the model that has parameters theta, but it depends also on our encoder. We're training the two together. First comment. Another comment is that if you do it like this, you're doing amortized inference. You know, there are other ways of doing of using an evidence lower bound that will involve updating the posterior at each iteration. Here we don't do this. We have a network uh, that performs uh, inference for us, and it's amortized over the whole training set. So you train one network and you use it to compute your posterior every time. So that's one of the key things with uh, variational encoders. They perform amortized inference. Uh, so, some more comments about this equation. So it depends on the two networks, yes. Uh, we can also interpret it. It also has an autoencoder interpretation, as we said before. Uh, so why? You can see this here as encoding. You take x, you get a density, you take x, you take a density, you get a density over z, and you sample it. So you encode x into z. And then uh, you take z, and you try to predict x. So you try to reconstruct. Encode. Reconstruct, that's the encoder, that's what the encoder does. And we said earlier that for an autoencoder it should not be degenerate, 
we always need uh, a bottleneck on the amount of information that can go inside. And that's exactly what this term here does. It measures the number of bits that you need to uh, measure the amount of information that you need to go from the prior to the posterior, even S. Okay? And there is a minus, we're trying to maximize this thing. So we're penalizing the fact of putting too much information on X inside Z. So this is the information bottleneck in the autoencoder interpretation of the gates. All right. Um, in this equation, what's very nice about it is that everything is efficient and tractable. Okay, these <coughs> terms, they're all fit for networks. This is a fit for a network from Z to Z to X. This is also a fit for a network, so everything is efficient uh, to compute. So we've gained something compared to using the intractable equation that we had before. Now we can compute things. What we've lost, of course, is that it's an approximation, it's a lower bound, and so if it's very loose, then our lower bound is useless. So we need a tight lower bound, and it's not clear how to guarantee that for now. Okay. Um, so one more comment on this regularization term. If you look at it, well, it's always positive, and it's zero when uh, Q equal P. Okay? That's the, so you're trying to maximize this equation. Okay? Maximize this quantity. Which means you're trying to minimize this one. So it would seem like it's a good idea to put it to zero and say q equals p. Trying to maximize my equation. But if you do this, it means that, well, q equals p, so q, I mean, the distribution on z becomes independent of x. Okay? So your encoder has learned nothing useful. And here, so this term will be zero, you gain something. But the, pr the first term, the reconstruction, and now here we put again P of Z. So Z becomes independent of X. So it's going to be very hard to reconstruct the right X without any information of what this X looks like. So if you put this term to zero, this term is going to blow. Okay? Blow up. So there's going to be a balance to be found between, uh, between these two terms, basically, depending on how good the encoder is, and depending on how good the decoder is, uh, you will put more or less information, but the optimum is probably never going to be zero. Okay? All right, so let's, so this, this elbow, we can rewrite it uh, in another way. You've seen this before, let's go fast. So we're going to use Bayes' rule uh, to replace, so, Bayes' rule here, to replace this term. I mean, just trust me. So it will give us this. I'll put all the equation. Yeah, great. Okay, so we're using here, here using Bayes' rule to replace this term. So that's what I did here. Okay. Uh, now, we're going to rewrite this a little bit. Uh, so we're going to take out these two terms here. From, uh, from the integral, okay? And we're going to put them in the first term, so that's what I did here, okay? And, well, the two terms that are left, it's again a KL divergence, so I write it as a KL divergence, okay? Now, in the left term, these two things simplify. So you only have P theta of x left. Of course, it's independent of Q phi, so you can take it out of the expectation, the expectation becomes one, and so you get this term. And you also have that term. Okay. So that gives us another, all of these are equalities, so it gives us another way of writing the elbow. Uh, yeah, this is the useful one that we use for training. But we can use this one for interpre interpretation. So the second line is intractable, of course. The left quantity P theta of x, we can't compute it, that's where we started from. And also the second term, uh, the posterior of, on Z or P theta, that's also extremely hard to compute. If we could, we would use this directly. We wouldn't train an encoder network. Yes? Um, isn't a variation of the word just off the word in the sense that the variation of the word is that the problem of computation really always only in the end of the variation of the word and not the program. It is saying Well, uh, it just it seems that we 
sure that this, these equations are a bit heavy the first time you see them, but uh, okay. In a autoencoder, the, the one thing that you, you can say is that you don't get an estimate of, uh, of the likelihood on the data. Okay? This is the only way of constructing a autoencoder in a way that it gives you guarantees on the likelihood of the data under your model. Okay? So an autoencoder that is not variational could be useful for representation learning. Like, let's say you, take the, you try to compress information and you evaluate the latent somehow in another manner. But uh, you won't get a likelihood. So if that's your goal, <coughs> Uh, can we discuss this afterwards? I'm, I'm running. Uh, I, I mean, I, your question is interesting, but it will take me too long, and I'm starting to run out of time. So, sorry. Look, let's discuss this later. Okay. Um, okay. So the second form is intractable. Uh, it's in some sense more interpretable. First of all, it's obvious that it's overbound in this form because the right term is always positive. Okay. Um, and now we can comment on the tightness. Okay. Here. We're trying to maximize. This quantity is independent of phi. So, uh, in this case, now the optimal thing to do to maximize this quantity is to put this term here to zero. Okay. In this form, it's clear that your, the optimum, the optimal to maximize this quantity is to maximize this one and put this to zero. That's your target. Okay. First, if you manage to do this, it means that your bound is now tight. You'll never manage perfectly, but it's ideal. And, uh, okay, what does this mean? It means that the optimal thing that we, we hope to learn from Q5 is the exact uh, posterior of P theta. This quantity here, that's what we would use if we could compute it. We can't. But if we manage to approximate it perfectly, it's the same thing, obviously. Okay, that's the optimal thing. So that's what we hope to get from our encoder. Perfect approximation of the posterior. Okay, uh, some more comments. I'm going to go a bit more quickly here. Uh, some more comments on the regularization term. So we said it's an information bottleneck. Uh, if we pick Q and P to be Gaussians, we can compute it analytically. Okay? We don't need to resort to many approximations. If these two things are Gaussians, computing the KL between two Gaussians is something we know how to do. Okay. That's what I wrote here. Um, Yeah, it's a different different triple function of the network parameters. That's clear. Um, okay, that's the reconstruction term is easy to interpret. Uh, now there is the question of how we are going to train this uh, this equation in practice. The thing is here we still have integrals over continuous space, so infinite, so we can't use them directly. We'll have to approximate with finite numbers of samples. So we'll have to sample a finite number of latents from Q5, and then try to reconstruct and approximate the integral as a sum, as a finite sum over our reconstructions. Okay. Um, now that's, there's a problem here. We're doing sampling, and sampling is non-differentiable. And to train networks by uh, backpropagation, we need things to be differentiable. So how do we handle this? Uh, we could use reinforce which would uh, you know, take samples and uh, use this to get an approximation of the gradient, but it's quite noisy. In fact, in this case, it's pretty easy to, to do better. You can use what's called the reparameterization trick. So we know how to reshape a standard Gaussian into any Gaussians. And we, we, we've seen that our density is parameterized by the mean and variance parameters. So all we have to do is try to treat the randomness as an input of the network. It comes from the outside. So we're doing this, the sampling here outside of the network, we give the result of this randomness uh, procedure, and we reshape it to, uh, so that we get a Z that comes from the Gaussian that we wanted and not from a unit Gaussian. 
uh, and then everything becomes differentiable with respect to, uh, to the parameters. The, the, the randomness is treated as an input. Uh, so we'll be able to uh, approximate the second term with sampling and it will have a low variance. Okay? So here's a cartoon drawing of uh, the spontaneous way you would do things. So you would encode and then you would have a step where you sample and you'd have to back propagate through this. In that case you'd have to use the reinforced algorithm. If you do it with reparameterization, x is an input, the noise is also an input, and from there you can do only differentiable operations. So that's a simple trick, but it's actually crucial, and people didn't think of it initially. This is the variance of the estimation. Okay, to wrap up, here is what our network looks like. We have an encoder, a decoder, we back forward propagate, backward propagate, and we have estimates of the gradients for each network. So, here are some samples obtained with early <coughs> models. Uh, we can compare VEs and GAMs. So both of these models are quite small, we can do better than this, but they're comparable. And the crucial observation here is that the VAE tends to do pretty blurry samples, whereas the GAM produces crispy area image. And it's comparable because the networks are of comparable capacity. Okay. So this, can, this is due to several factors. There's the reconstruction loss that plays a role, the KL regularization that plays a role, it tends to make things blurry. Whereas again, it doesn't have these constraints. On the other hand, with the GAN, you don't have guarantees of how well you fit the full training set. Whereas for VAs, you can compute that. So there's a trade-off there. Okay. Um, all right, so that's it for VAs. Let's go to another class of models, uh, deep invertible transformation. So that's going to be the case where uh, you try to uh, constrain your, your family of functions to uh, functions for which you can easily compute p theta x. Okay. The key idea is, though, is that we are going to learn invertible functions that go from the latent space to the image space, and that will let us compute the density. So first of all, that means that the latent space and the image space need to have the same dimensionality. That's pretty really different from the autoencoder case. Okay. Let's say uh, we have a simple prior in our latent space, which is the option. We're going to learn uh, an invertible function, but very flexible, that will reshape this density into something more complicated. Okay? So to generate, we start from the latent space, and we go to the image space. That gives us a sample. To infer, so to get the probability of the image that we're looking at, we do the reverse. We start from data space, to apply our invertible transformation. It gives us a latent... Uh, it gives us a latent representation, and now we can uh, evaluate this latent representation under our prior in the latent space. So maybe it's a Gaussian. Okay. So I take my image, make it go through the invertible function, and I get something in a space in which I do have a density. Alright, that's the high level intuition. Uh, this is tractable, first thing, and also it gives you exact inference, which is not the case in the VA setting. In the VA setting, we had approximate inference. Here we have exact inference. It's an invertible function, so one input corresponds to one output, and vice versa. So how do we compute P of X? Well, we use the change of variable formula. So, uh, let's say we're given an X. We map it through F of X, that gives us a latent. And in the latent space, we have a prior. So we evaluate the density of this latent vector under the prior, that gives us a density. To get to the density in image space, we simply have to apply the change of variable formula. So the change of variable formula tells us that we have to multiply this density by the Jacobian, uh, and the determinant of the Jacobian of the function. Okay? So this is practical. Uh, but, okay, there are some constraints here. Yeah. This is good, but of course to, to make this usable in practice, we need to ensure two things. First, we say, say the function needs to be invertible, so we have to guarantee that. And two, this term, the, log, the second term, the log deter determinant, needs to be efficient to compute, so that we can train fast. Okay? So, how are we going to do that? Well, the bottom of here disappears, but... Uh, we're going to take a vector and cut it into two groups. Okay? We're going to keep the first group unchanged, and we're going to... Uh, to learn the second group as a transformation of the first, and you're missing the interesting line. So, uh, ah, aha, okay. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, so we keep the first group uh, numbered one uh, unchanged, and we update the second group with a function of the first group only. So there's going to be a mean, uh, a term that controls, <coughs> that moves, and a, a term that controls the scale. Okay? So that's the basic idea. To do the reverse, it's easy. The first, uh, the first set of variables didn't change, so it still doesn't change. And if we kept track of our uh, location and scale of parameters here and there, it's easy to invert. We divide and subtract. Uh, rather, subtract and divide. Okay. So this, this construction is easy to invert, so that's very clear. The question is, does it have tractable decoded in uh, Oh yeah, by the way, we don't need to invert S and T to invert the transform uh, the invertible layers. We just need to keep track of their values. Uh, and these functions, S and T, so this transformation here is a very simple one, perhaps even simplistic, it's quite constrained. Uh, but the, the functions that we use to compute the scale and various parameters, they can be arbitrarily flexible. So that's how we compensate. We have a simple function, but we choose it very well by using very complex functions to, to get those, uh, those terms. All right. So now, does it have tractable Jacobians? Yes. If you compute the Jacobians well, the first set of variables didn't change, so the Jacobian is an identity matrix. Uh, this is clearly zero, it didn't change, and so it doesn't depend on the second set of variables. This term here may be complicated, but actually we don't care. Forget about it. Uh, and this term is a diagonal term. It changed with respect to the first variable. Uh, that's good. So, the, the Jacobian of uh, this, this matrix is easy to, come to, uh, to compute because it's a triangular matrix, so we just take, uh, take the terms on the diagonal. And that's tractable. That will give us this term. Okay? So with this construction, we have invertible functions and tractable Jacobians. And the log likelihood uh, is thus easy, easily computed and optimized with uh, gradient descent. Okay, there remains a question. How do we partition these variables? If we say we keep the first, uh, we cut in two and keep the first group unchanged. If we do this at every layer, it's never going to change. That doesn't sound very useful. So at each layer, we will change the set of variables that gets updated and that doesn't get updated. Okay? How to do this? Well, you could think of two things. You could first think about partitioning spatially, okay? So, you could use a checkerboard pattern. You could uh, say that one variable out of two remains unchanged, and at the next layer, you will reverse the pattern. White tires become black, and black becomes white. Become white. Another way of partitioning could be along uh, feature channels, okay? You could decide that the first half of your feature gets updated and the second doesn't. And of course, you could alternate between these two ways of doing things. That's what real MVP does. That's maybe one of the first papers using this. Okay. So how does it look in practice? It's a convolutional neural network, but some activations are masked. So that you, well, that they're zero, and uh, that implements the partition. Okay. You can stack many, of the, uh, many such transformations. Uh, so, as we said, you should probably alternate between the masking patterns. Uh, compose many transformations, sum the determinants to get your final likelihood. Uh, and the, uh, the final thing that you could use is uh, um, an abstraction, a hierarchy, of, a hierarchy of abstractions. So, these images are high dimensional, so they're costly. These computations are costly. You may wish to regularly decrease the spatial dimension of Z. But because you need to keep the number of variables unchanged so that your transformation is invertible, it means you will need to squeeze your features, basically. You reduce the dimensional, spatial dimensionality by two, but you increase uh, the number of channels accordingly so that you still have the same number of variables. Finally, you can regularly remove parts of your variable and put a prior there and keep working on what's left. This way, uh, you have a hierarchy that can build abstract feature, and you save some computation, because as you remove variables, the network becomes less costly. All right, uh, so we, let's skip this. Samples, okay. 
these are samples and images of what you can get, but let's move to another class of model. The last class of model uh, is the one that doesn't use latest. It's called well, auto-regressive density estimation. So what's the idea here? There's going to be noisy anywhere. Forget about it. Uh, we want to model a distribution over a vector. Of course, we can always write it as uh, a product of conditionals. Okay? So model the first variable, then model the second given the first, third given the first and second, etc., etc. We can always write things like this. Okay? Um, and we're going to use a deep neural network to model these dependencies. And that's going to give us tractable uh, likelihood computations without any integral over latest. Uh, what can be said about this is that at sample time, we're going to have slow, uh, slow sample sampling process. Because before you can sample the second variable, you need to sample the first, etc. So you're going to have to sample, if you're generating an image with many pixels, you're going to have to generate the pixels one by one. So it's slow. That's at sample time. At train time, it's not necessarily an issue. Okay, what's the first way you could do this? We say, let's model this as a sequence, so why not use a recurrent network? Didn't present what it is, but bear with me. So uh, let's say if this is our image, and we're looking at, we're trying to predict the red pixel. We're allowed to look at all previous pixels in our chain, but not at the next ones. Okay? So we could have a recurrent network go over the image like this. Okay? Why not? Um, so if you define things like this, there is, it's a recurrent network, it doesn't care about the length of your sequence. So you decouple the, the complexity of your model from the length of the sequence because it's recurrent. That's the property of recurrent networks. In fact, you could implement it with uh, two sets of bidirectional LSTMs, one that would be working uh, left to bottom, another one that would be working left, uh, sorry, well, you see the picture. And then you combine these things to see all of the pixels that you were allowed uh, to see. And that will look something like this. Okay? So you have two streams, two LSTMs working in parallel, and you combine them right, so that when looking at a pixel here, you only take information from the pixels you're allowed to take information from. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is actually also slow at training time. I say it's necessarily going to be slow at sample time, but this is even slow at training time, because I'm looking at my pixels one after the other. So that's slow. Works well, but it requires some time. So another way to do this is to use uh, a convolutional neural network, uh, but mask the activation so that you never look at the pixel you're not allowed to look at. So how would this uh, look like? Let's say I'm trying to predict the pixel, the black pixel here, uh, and let's say this is the convolution, the kernel that I would normally use. Okay, I'm not allowed to look at the future. I'm only lo allowed to look at this region here. Okay. So I mask the rest of the image so that my convolution only looks at the information it's allowed to look at. And as I stack these layers, the receptive field of this thing is going to grow bigger and bigger until it covers the whole image. But because of the mask, it will only cover the things that I'm allowed to look at. So actually, we can go back to this image. Uh, imagine that this is a filter, okay? This is a filter of one, two, three, uh, seven by seven, okay? I'm, I want to predict this pixel, and I have this filter, a filter of this size. So I have to mask all these pixels here. That's, and for, if I'm at the first layer, of course I cannot look at this pixel to predict its value. I would be cheating. So I will also have to mask this pixel. Okay? Now at the next layer, the mask will change slightly. I will be allowed to look at the red pixel at the next layer, because it, will, it contains a feature that was computed without looking at the pixel I'm trying to predict. So essentially I have a stack of convolutional features that are masked, and the first mask is different in that it has one fewer pixel. That's how you can implement it in practice. I hope that's clear, I don't know. So that's how you build a pixel CNN. If you do it like this, actually, there's going to be a problem. You're going to have a blind spot in this region here when looking at this pixel here. Uh, because of the way it grows, uh, you will never look at the region at the 
this region of the image. So you need to improve this slightly, and one way to do this is to actually use, uh, sorry, uh, is to actually use two streams, one that looks at a full line, so it will expand like this, but it lags behind by one line, and another stream that looks to the left. And we, when you combine these streams right, you will no longer have a blind spot. Okay, maybe, you know, this is a lot of detail, you don't need to understand it, but let's just say that there is a way of stacking convolutions such that you respect the ordering and you don't have blind spots. If you stack enough layer, you eventually cover the whole image. Um, so this construction is very efficient. Okay, uh, it's been applied to images, but also to audio signal. We have the wave network is a very successful one. To videos, uh, yeah. So here are some samples of uh, early papers. So you can, you see, you can do training is fast. I, as we said, it's just a CNN with masks, but otherwise, it trains exactly as a CNN. At sample time, it's slow, but you can generate uh, good-looking samples. Okay. Okay, uh, so one, let's go into a little refinement that you can do on pixel CNNs. Let's say you're unhappy about the fact that it's uh, very slow to sample. Let's say you want to build an application where you can, where you can get uh, samples fast. So what do you do with that context? Uh, you don't actually have to model all of the dependencies in this chain. You could separate the, the, the values in your input into groups. Within groups, uh, model them simultaneously, but model the groups autoregressively. Okay? You don't have to model the full chain. And that's the idea between, well, there are, there are a bunch of papers that do this, but maybe this one was the first. So the idea is that you're going to build a scale pyramid. So you will downsample your image, that will give you the first group of pixels, and you model all these pixels at the same time. Okay? Then you would sample the resolution, and that's the second group I mean, uh, second group of pixels, let's say, and you will again model all these pixels simultaneously, but conditioned on the previous group. And you can do this many times until you've reached uh, a good resolution. And as you see, it's some, it can work pretty well. So the key here is that you have a trade off. Your likelihood will be a bit worse because you removed some relations that you had in your initial chain, so of course you lose something. But at sample time, now the length of the sequence is only the number of groups that you have. So it can be much faster than uh, the number of pixels in the image. In fact, the original pixel CNN can be seen as these constructions where each group contains <coughs> one pixel. So uh, that's the thing. What controls how fast you sample is the number of groups that you have. Also, this, uh, this is built in, these grouping things are built in a smart way. Uh, it's taking the structure of the image into account, basically very far, uh, pixels that are very close to each other, they are very correlated, so you really want to model the uh, relations between them very well, whereas if they are further apart, you don't need to spend that much computation uh, modeling the correlations. Okay. Yeah, this could look like this, so numbers give you groups, so the, the group one was our initial group, uh, the image at a low resolution, then you want to sample your image, so you will condition on this group and predict the second group, the red one. Okay. And then you do this again for the pixel here, the, the green pixel, and now you've uh, sampled by a factor two, two by two. And if you do this again and again, you will get a big image in the end. Still much faster to sample than a standard pixel scene. And if you visualize this process, it could look something like this. First, we have sample horizontally. Uh, then vertically, so you get a rectangle at some point. So with this implementation that we described, uh, you get roughly 100 times speed up uh, versus pixel CNN for images of size uh, 512. That's really good if what you get is uh, sampling speed. Okay. Uh, and you can see that it's, I mean, this model is not very recent, it's pretty good at adding uh, detail to low resolution images. So, generally models might struggle to produce an image that has good uh, structure, but if you give it a uh, low resolution of an image, well, the pixel CNN construction will be very good at upsampling it and obtaining something that looks good. Okay. 
it shows that it's they struggle more with uh, producing coherent spatial structure than producing good detail. All right, that's it. That's what I wanted to talk about today. Thanks a lot for your attention.